The Battle of New Orleans Oh, I march to the Battle of New Orleans. Phil Oaks, I ain't marching anymore. In a cold, foggy dawn, the magnificent British hoplites, 5,300 strong, splendid in their coats of red, with white cross belts down their fronts, came strutting and hauling cannon out over a stubbly field of cane a few miles south and east of the city. Not many weeks after shelling Fort McHenry, the English had sent boats of troops from the Chesapeake under the command of General Edward Pockingham down to Jamaica to join a naval force, which had then sailed toward Louisiana to take New Orleans with the battle cry of beauty and booty. As if the scrolls of history belonged to them alone, the spiffy epaulets of empire and their intimidating bluster of polished brass were shining in the fog as they surged up the narrow, pink-dawned field with the Mississippi River to their left and a thick and impassable cypress swamp to the right with its eerie dangles of moss over mule-eating pocks of mire and caisson-sucking sink pits toward a long, dry canal and the waiting Americans. It was January 8th, 1815. A raid to the north, behind some quickly crafted battlements and a line guarding the polis, were the troops of Andy Jackson, fresh from his slaughter of the creeks. Sentries on the southern coast had instantly reported when the English ships had landed on some small islands at the mouth of Lake Bourne just four days ago. The man they called Old Hickory, had figured out the path the invaders would take for beauty and booty, and placed his forces as quietly as he could along the canal. He commanded a mighty mix of troops. The history books vary, but there were about 4,700. Some were the fancily uniformed men of the New Orleans militia. Others were the, quote, tough boys, unquote, from Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky, with their long-barreled frontier rifles, who'd come at Jackson's urging down through the Chickasaw forests, down through the Choctaw trails and the Natchez Trace, down along the Cumberland River in keelboats to slide into the Mississippi on the way to the Gulf. Not a few of the Tennessee militiamen were wearing raccoon and foxskin hats. They carried their bullets in their pockets. The British called them the dirty shirts. Also arrayed in the fog with Andy were a few actual pirates in the service of Jean Lafitte, who lived in the nearby coastal swamplands of Barataria. And then there were several hundred free Haitian blacks standing with their rifles pointed across the canal. Among them was a man named Lemoyne Labage, who had emigrated from Haiti ten years ago and had settled in New Orleans. Labage wore the bonnet rouge of the French Revolution and very much had the principles of liberté, égalité, fraternité, on his mind as he cleaned his single-shot rifle in the pre-dawn whispers. All in all, 600 African Americans and Haitians in two battalions took part in the Battle of New Orleans. Lemoine Labage was one of those Haitian Republican soldiers who'd gone to Texas about a year ago to help the Mexican revolutionaries. And when Andy Jackson had arrived in New Orleans, 
last December, Lemoine answered his call to stand against the Redcoats. Andy was famous for anger and energy. Like George Washington, he liked land, especially the lands of the defeated Creeks, and got as much of it as he could. You can look it up in Howard Zinn, how after the Creek War of 1814, quote, Jackson and friends of his began buying up the seized Creek lands. He got himself appointed treaty commission and dictated a treaty which took away half the land of the Creek nations. Zen calls Andy the most aggressive enemy of the Indians in early American history. Even so, Mr. Jackson had a practical, populist side of his soul, which thrilled the nation, however mean he could wax. Andy had a ferocious zeal. He was great at rousing his men to race toward bullets. He urged us on, 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 and on we raced. Three times the Brits marched up the narrow land toward the canal. Three times we gunned them down. Three times they were thinned, then they quit. It took less than 30 minutes to win. I was standing next to a white man in a fox skin cap, even though I was a freed slave from the Isle of Santo Domingo. We shot, reloaded, and shot again. Creoles, the guys from Tennessee, Haitians, and those the textbooks call the free men of color. All of us killed or brought to the ground more than 2,000 invaders. Lemoyne Labage shot many a red coat. He even brought to Acheron a famous English general. Then he too fell to a musket ball and lay there in the cane stubble, bleeding to the wide. All of a sudden a woman, she looked about 20 years of age, wearing silver-sided sandals, raced across the field, risking the skin-tearing grape shot she had to jump across many the lifeless till she knelt by Labage's side to staunch the hemic flow. There was a bright gold sun sewn upon her cowled robe. Who are you? I am Marie Laveau, the healer, as she powdered his wounds while wrapping his leg in a long ribbon cut from her petticoat. She knelt above my great, 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 great grandfather, rubbed around his wounds with a dotted line of red gray powder. A-E-I-O-U-O was what her soft, healing syllables sounded like as she prayed for his soul in the stubble. Once it was over and he could limp around, Lemoine was not even invited to the dinner tents. They bivouacked the Haitian partisans of the Bonnet Rouge and the Afro-Creoles from New Orleans, far away from the boys from Tennessee. But the Creole streets exploded with applause and parties and instant parades of all the people all the same. Andy went on to be president. The masses were buzzing north and south for this proof of national honor. Give me that old time national honor. That old time national honor. That old time national honor. It was good enough for one of the best black poker players in New Orleans. 
where great granddad Lamoine lived the rest of his life and made his living with the game he picked up from the French revolutionaries in Haiti. In the years after the mixed race triumph in the cane field, the Louisiana slaveholders were mightily afraid of black insurrection based on the Bonnet Rouge. The city's whites enacted as much total control as they could, yet the city's mix retained its sophisticated intermingling. The one won some lumber in a card game in 1830 and used it to build a home on the edge of the quarter. His descendants been living there ever since. That is, the house was handed down for generations till his great, 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 great granddaughter, the poet and singer Grace Labage, still owned it at the time of the stolen election of 2000. Then came Katrina and the floods of Poseidon, which twisted the house of Grace Labage to a jumble of shards like the one Lemoyne had once won at cards. Grace and her husband went to the insurance agency, the same one to which for 50 years she and before her her mother and father had paid and paid and paid in the march of months, paid and paid their monthly obligations. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Labarge, you did have some wind and fire insurance, but this was from Poseidon. Besides, your paperwork, even your deed, the proof you even breathing, got lost in the water. After your deductible, we can give you $623. We'll have it ready in about four months. No help, no help, no help. No help from Bush, no help from FEMA, no help from the sky, no help from the banks, no help from insurance, no help from microloans, no help from dying in the wars, no help from weeping. Being in the cathedral, no help from believing the TV screen, no help from praying to idols, no help, no help, no help, no help. Invocation to the spirit of Andy Jackson and Marie Laveau in the St. Louis Cemetery. I am Grace Labage. I am calling you down, Andrew Jackson. You were a speculator, Andy. You bought and sold slaves. You were a mean guy, but you were a Democrat. And the Battle of New Orleans is never over, Andy. It's never over. You have to help us. It's a rigged system, Andy. Old Hickory, Creek land grabber, early populist. And I am calling on you too, Marie Laveau. Come down to save my grandfather's house with your fiery exes and bags of sacum grass. Confound the mass. Give us a vast reprieve from the groaning crass and the griefs of class. Stand near me, Marie Laveau. Stand by, oh Grandfather Lavage. I know you're buried here too, without a name. Come forth, oh Andy, with your primitive trust in the goodness, and shatter the rich who shudder our dreams in the sure-shaking, shitterly ditch. 